Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we conclude our study of the Feast of Israel 2. And this is part 2 of 2. Um, if it's not in the Bible, then it's fine to know about it, but uh, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't pretend that it's something that God instituted like Hanukkah. Now, by the way, Jesus appears to have at least taken part in Hanukkah. He went to the temple, and it's called the Feast of Lights. And uh, Rosh Hashanah is one of the... We'll look at that in just a second. So I want to talk about the dates for a moment. We already went through the chapter. We saw how he laid it out. He said the date. Nisan is Abib, is the first month. Sometimes it's called first month, sometimes Abib. Nisan is the way it's referred to now. And if you look on the calendar, it happens Nisan, even though it's on the 3 o'clock part of the chart I have, it's actually the first month of the religious year. And as you see, it normally lands somewhere around March, April, and that's why Easter is close to that. Now, i got to say this. Easter is a ridiculous thing. One reason. And again, we, we don't make a big deal about Easter, but we don't try to fix everybody on it. But Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, Nisan 18, in uh, 30 AD, and that was on a Sunday. But Nisan 18 isn't on a Sunday every year. It's impossible. Your birthday, whatever day you were born, I was born on a Thursday, my birthday isn't on Thursday every year. It's impossible to celebrate the date of a thing and it land on the same day of the week. It's impossible. And so that's why there's so much trouble when it comes to counting up these days and counting up Pentecost among the different groups and everything. Because uh, it's not really done biblically by most people. Um, but So what, what we do every year, I try to do every year, is when Easter comes around, just give you the information. Let you know this is how if everybody wanted to do it biblically, <laughs> we wouldn't have Easter Sunday. Sometimes we'd have Easter Tuesday or Easter Thursday. So the second feast then starts the sundown of Nisan 14, which is the beginning of Nisan 15. And that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so it goes uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And it's sundown of the 21st then uh, is the end of the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's a high Sabbath. Then, and, and of course, the reason why um, uh, they, this, this doesn't have the days on there exactly, but uh, you can see it lands in the same month of Nisan. And then comes first fruits, and this was always a little confusing to me, but first fruits actually then is on the 16th. And so you kind of have a, a mixture, a combination of holidays, overlap. And we can kind of compare it to somebody who uh, has a birthday on another holiday, like Christmas Day. Or, you know, if, you, if, if they have a holiday at the end of November, sometimes it might land on Thanksgiving Day or whatever. So what do you do as a family? You have a turkey and a birthday cake. And you'll sing happy birthday and then enjoy turkey. You know, you just combine them, and that's what happens here. And so you see, now, keep an eye. You start to maybe start to see what we're kind of leaning towards here. You can see how the feasts are laid out. All three of the first are in the spring in the song. Now we have Pentecost, and as I said, there's a big uh, uh, scandal, uh, but. It, I believe the correct date is Sivan, um, the month, uh, 6th and 7th. And there, as I said, there's a big controversy over this one. And it, it has to do with uh, the way you're told to start counting is a Sabbath. But some think, well, oh, that means that then the Feast of Unleavened Bread the day after Passover was a high Sabbath. And so they would start counting then. 
but the way God lays it out, it's not a high Sabbath. It's after you've offered the wave offering, the following Sabbath, which would be the seventh day Sabbath, that's when you start counting. Then you had guys like Herbert Armstrong, some of you recognize that name, the Worldwide Church of God, and he claimed that you would start counting from that day, so your first day would be Monday instead of Sunday. And so they would have their pretend feast of Pentecost a day after everybody else. And uh, like I said, people will split over that stuff and everything. Missing the point, aren't they? So then the fifth feast was the Feast of Trumpets. That's the one, Jenny, called Rosh Hashanah. On the month Tishri, uh, the first through the third. Now, now look where Tishri is on the uh, chart. It's near September, October. You see that? So you have three spring, March, April feasts. Then you have one around the time of Kim's birthday. And then you don't have another one until one, two, three, four months later in the month of Tishri. And then you have trumpets. And then you have the Day of Atonement, which is on the 10th and 11th of Tishri. And then you have Tabernacles, which is on the 15th and 16th of Tishri. Okay? Now, first time I saw that, first two or three times I saw that, that was of no real consequence to me. I thought, okay, that's neat. And you, the, I don't mean to be blasphemous or anything about this, just saying that, um, what do you call it when people are always, almost maybe call it, he's maybe analytical where they put things in groups or something. I can't think of the term. There's a, the, but he kind of clumps things. Like three in spring and one in the, you know, June. And then three in fall. And they call them that. The spring feast, summer Pentecost, and the uh, Fall feast. Yeah, I just thought it's just you try to get to know God, and you're thinking, well, how's he, that, is that how he, click, he ticks? You know, what, what's his reason for doing that? I had the time, I had no idea. You know. Well, first of all, we see seven, and you're going to see seven over and over through Scripture. But if you studied Revelation with us, the seven trumpets the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials, and the seven churches, seven uh, angels, seven, all over the book of Revelation. Here you have seven feasts. So it looks like there's a little bit of purpose here. He's doing it on purpose. And I believe the feasts are shadows because you have four in spring and that would represent what we saw in the first advent. Then you have basically the summer. Summer begins June 21st. Pentecost is always around that time. And that's when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place in the book of Acts. And we call that the day of Pentecost. And then you have this just a kind of a blank period of time but what's going on between Pentecost and the fall feasts what's going on there's planting there's watering what's that called sowing a lot of work um, you study church history you'll find that there was a lot of blood uh, who was it? Uh, Dan, you might know this, said that the blood of uh, patriots is the uh, waters, the seed of freedom or something like that. I'm, I'm looking for a quote there. Was it Jefferson who said that? Yeah. 
And then, of course, you've heard the blood of the martyrs. And what's that, John? What has that uh, go? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's how it's said. And so, if you look in church history, that's the same farming principle that has taken place. And then, what do you have? From the time of the Reformation and the King James Bible, you've had a huge harvest. Until now. And it's starting to wane. There's still a lot of harvest going over in Asia and parts of Africa. But in North America and South America and Europe, not a lot. A lot of what's going on is a false gospel, false gospels, plural, people who are falling into the cults and New Age religions. and Atheism has increased more and more every year. And in, we talked about Israel itself. Israel itself, something around 80% of the people there don't even profess to believe in a personal God. So this whole thing of the feast and the way it's laid out matches human history. The plan of God. It's amazing. You have four in the spring, summer's the grace period, and three in the fall. So, we're going to have another study on, uh, on how it relates to Bible prophecy, but before we close tonight, real quick, didn't realize it was going a little long. We don't uh, keep Feast. You won't come here and see us observing the feast. Why? Well, it's real simple. Christians are to keep the feast in their fulfillment, not in the shadow of the law. 1 Corinthians 5.8 says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, it's the, what we saw in the Old Testament has an application for us, but it's not for us to try to somehow observe the feasts. Because it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. The feast can only be kept literally with the tabernacle or temple priesthood and service. If you don't have a temple or a tabernacle, you don't have a priest, you don't have the feasts. There's no way. Without temple sacrifice, there's no keeping of the feasts in any literal, especially any biblical sense. Back in this, you can look these up. There's all over the Old Testament. Second Chronicles two four says, "It's a commandment. Behold, I build an house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to Him and to burn before Him sweet incense and for the continual showbread and for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the what? And on the what? And on the solemn what? Of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. The feasts are connected to the tabernacle and temple." You can't have one without the other. So those who claim to keep the feast today are pretenders. And I'm going to tell you something. They sell the books and the videos, and they'll even sell you the get-ups. You can play dress-up. They'll sell you the utensils and uh, shofar. Now, I'd, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having some of this stuff, like a shofar. I'd love to have one of those. As a matter of fact, we need to get one. We take our five-minute break and you guys won't come back. All right. You'll know it's time to get back up here. But uh, they're expensive, so I probably won't get one anytime soon. Let's get a fake one. But they sell these things so that people can get all dressed up and pretend to be keeping the feast. And you might think, oh, it's no big deal. Well, it is. It's really sad because it's unbiblical. And God condemns keeping the feast in violation of His commandments. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13, 14. Real quick. Isaiah is right before Jeremiah. Isaiah 1, verses 13 and 14. In time of apostasy. Isaiah is talking to the Jews. And he says in verse 13, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths and the callings of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul, what? Hateth. I am weary to bear them. 
and so on and so on. You'll see that over and over when they were in apostasy. And right now, if you are rejecting Jesus Christ, for starters, you're in apostasy. And again, the only way to keep the feast is to have a temple and a law. And so that's where we'll pick up next time is in the study of the feasts and how they really apply for us is in the question of prophecy. Fulfilled, but yet to be fulfilled. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint ahead of time as I'm going to talk for a few minutes about why the feasts have absolutely nothing to do with the rapture. Every, almost every date setter somehow uses the feasts of Israel to somehow line up and date the rapture. And if you know that the feasts don't have anything to do with the church, they belong to Israel, then you know that not to buy that book. <laughs> or that DVD or whatever it is they're hawking. And uh, we'll talk more about that. Any questions real quick? I went over. Sorry about that. I think we all went over when we were eating cake too. So. Yeah, Charlie? Oh, can I ask you to stop for just a second? I want to educate everybody. I'm going to use Charlie as my um, guinea penguin. This is not going to be over the speakers. Hello? This is not going to be over the speakers. Okay. The point of you using the microphone is so that it go, goes on the video. And so I won't have to sit and try to decipher what you're saying when I edit the videos. Sometimes it's taken me almost two hours of extra time. And so by... And you only have to hold it, you know, about right there. Yeah, don't eat the microphone or lick it or anything like that. So, Charlie, what was you saying? So I was just saying that, um, you know, every time people bring up holidays and how, like, I've known Messianic Jew or Jews that, you know, try and say you should keep, you know, all this stuff. And um, Colossians chapter 2 says, verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an whole holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath days so like if your work schedule doesn't work out that you can you know like the seventh day adventists are wrong because they try and keep the sabbath right. and like people who say oh you should do the daniel diet yeah. no <laughs> that's wrong because you know paul tells us in colossians no <laughs> he just like flat out says yeah. no so it's like it's very, it's just very simple. You know how some of the uh, Gentile uh, b blockheads would try to get around that. And they'll say, well, that's, those are talking about Jewish feasts and Jewish this and that. And it, yes, because he's a Jew and he's talking to a, a church that is made up of a lot of Jews, but also everybody in there is reading the Old Testament. So he's using what they, he knows they know to tell them that they're not to judge people on holidays, on what you eat, on those sorts of things, and that we're to get away from that. Um, but that's how they try to get away with that, but it's baloney. <laughs> but uh, it, it does, is usually related to, I'm glad Charlie brought that up because this, this feast thing, especially the groups who pretend to be keeping the feast, it's usually tied to also a lot of law, a lot of legalism, a lot of rules. You're supposed to say Yahshua, Hamashiach. <laughs> and, and a lot of them even have uh, you know, the women wearing uh, uh, coverings and then uh, pants on women, you know, they want to preach on that or, you know, <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a sermon by John R. Rice. Bob, hair, bossy wives, and women preachers. I'm going to preach on them tonight. All right, any other questions real quick? All right, let's stand and we'll just close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for this time in Your book and we do thank You for what You've taught us and it's a foundation to be built upon. 
and as we read our Old Testament, we will be more familiar with it. It will seem more familiar as we read it. Also, as we uh, study Bible prophecy, we will more and more see the connection, see the right connections and where to not make connections. And all these things are in obedience to your command that we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for teaching us for your Holy Spirit, who is our counselor. And may he also be our comforter from this point through the rest of the week. Comfort your people, keep your people in your grace, in your mercy. And give us all the desire to be serving you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.
My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full. His, he has riches untold. And I'm a child of the king. Amen. Amen. King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com.